Hello, everybody. It is great to be here one more time today. And my name is Gary Fowler, and I'm the CEO, President, and Founder of GSD Get You Done Venture Studios, Premier AI and Quantum Venture Studio, located in the heart of Silicon Valley. I'm a 17 time serial entrepreneur with uh, several unicorns under the belt. I was on the original management team at Click Software, which was sold to Salesforce for $1.35 billion and also EVA.AI, an AI HR tech company that I co-founded with Dr. David Yang. We believe that intellectual capacity is evenly spread around the world, but opportunities are not. With that, I have an incredible guest today, Ron Boken. He's focused on uh, artificial intelligence, got a very robust background from McGill to MIT and all the way to ChainML, where he's the founder and CEO. ChainML is an early stage startup focused uh, on a founded by a team focused on helping to understand the machine learning process to build a scalable and secure protocol for decentralized machine learning to unlock machine learning for web three and extend the power of blockchain Ooh, i love that with that i'd like to bring ron on board hi ron how are you doing today i'm doing great thanks gary how are you good so tell me about it how in the world do you go from mcgill to mit Oh, well, um, you know, that I, uh, I applied to, you know, grad schools, I guess, in the U.S. after uh, doing undergraduate at McGill and uh, decided to go to MIT, uh, which was a good experience. It was a little while ago. We were studying. Uh, I studied AI in a clinical decision making context uh, using, you know, older techniques than uh, today's deep learning. <laughs> We were just starting to do probabilistic methods back then. So how do you, you know, you went down through it, you graduated from MIT, and then did you move to the Valley right away or what happened? Uh, well, I, I did with my next startup. I, I um, started a company out of uh, the entrepreneurship competition at MIT, the 100K, um, that was focused on internet and moved to the Valley as part of that startup. We, we took it public in uh, late, uh, like late 1999. And uh, I've been out here in Silicon Valley ever since. Now, how was that? You came right at the boom years of the internet. And so also in 2000, we saw a little bit of a bust. How was it after coming out and you went down through it because you did, uh, you know, you went down through and if with the Seabridge internet solutions, in fact, you were there to March of 2001, one year after the bust. How was it? Well, you know, it was definitely uh, very different, right? I mean, I think you'd have been been in, in Silicon Valley long enough to go through several boom and bust cycles, right? It was completely crazy in 2000 here. And then in 2001, you know, it was a lot of empty space. People were writing off the death of Silicon Valley, which may sound familiar, Uh you know, empty offices in San Francisco. Uh, but, you know, we persevered. You know, I, I was uh, working on a new startup around uh, programming technology out of Xerox Park that was interesting um, and ended up getting back into AI uh, with an uh, ad tech company called Quantcast, where I, I ran uh, engineering and research really to, to build ad models, lookalike models using AI techniques. Now, so, if you, you know, you've been in this a long time. So how important is it to get stock options in a company, Ron? You've been through a number of different companies. What, since 96, uh, you graduated about 96 from MIT, right? Yeah. Yeah, in the 90s. And uh, how is it? How do you make your money? Like, it costs a lot of money to live in Silicon Valley, especially where you are in Los Altos. And how in the world... The people go down through how important are stock options to be able to afford the Silicon Valley lifestyle? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, definitely stock options, equity in startups were really important for me, you know, whether it was uh, at Seabridge or Quantcast or, you know, then the equity from starting uh, Think Big Analytics, which was really bringing AI to the enterprise that we sold to Teradata. Uh, you know, that, that, that's been a, a, a real source of opportunity for sure. So I think it's a great path, you know, and it's uh, one thing that I, I think is a, a turn to the better. The last few years it, it, here in the Bay Area, we started to see so much of uh, it becoming more of a big company town and people working and 
these giant technology organizations. And, you know, I think it's nice that you're starting to see a resurgence of startup life and people are realizing again that, you know, there's more opportunity working in earlier stage companies, as well as, you know, more fun and a chance to, to get more done um, than being stuck. In, uh, you know, there's no way to avoid uh, it being slow and hard to get things done in a hundred thousand person company. <laughs> and so have you gone down through what are some of the, if you could say, you know, three lessons that you've learned being out in the valley, what are those three lessons? You've been through a lot of stuff. What are the three things that, that allow you to be able to stay as long as you have? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one is you do always want to keep learning. And, you know, it's uh, the, the, the story, you know, in my career, technology has gone from being a, a small sector that, you know, specialists went into to, you know, driving the agenda and the planet. It's become the most important industry and really driving societal change in all aspects, right? So huge changes along the way and you have to sort of recalibrate. I mean, I think the, um, the, the speed and the level of sophistication is, uh, has picked up so much. You know, people are so much better now at, at building startups and scaling and, and there's a lot to be learned, right? So you, you, you can build on that. I mean, I think it helps a lot. You, you develop um, a, good, a good sense of, of the patterns and seeing what's going on to make good decisions as you advance in your career. And so I think, uh, you know, I, I, I believe that everyone uh, can keep improving their craft and be better at, at being entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, certainly for me, I, I've increasingly focused on, you know, what is the way that the startups I'm working in can have a positive impact in the broader ecosystem, right? So like with ChainML, we were really focused on both one, how to push back against some of the centralization of AI being controlled by big tech. And now looking at with these powerful AI models, how can you start to really um, build better systems on top of them that are, you know, predictable and useful and such that, you know, as the AI models get more powerful, we can have better oversight or ability to steer them in a way that we're, we're confident in what we're using them for. Now, it's interesting. And so, you know, when you, when you look out there, what, what is the reason that people move to Silicon Valley, right? I mean, there's opportunity, right? But what's the overlay? Is it because there's a lot of geeks out there and people like to hang around together? I know when I'm out there, I can feel it, you know, and I feel like normal because I talk to people about things that, you know, generative AI and and uh, and um, all kinds of things. And and it's just interesting when you have those different perspectives. But what about for you? What's the main thing? What keeps you there besides going to Santa Cruz and climbing in the mountains and <laughs> the, the weather? Right. It's all a lot better than at McGill or in uh, Boston. Yeah. What, what is it? Yeah, I mean, I think it is. Um, it, it's such a, um, a an innovative place, as you say. Like, there's so many amazing entrepreneurs and technologists here that you, you can interact with. You know, as you say, it's in the culture that you can talk. You know, that, that it's often you you can interact and talk with people who share an interest. So you know, it's really valuable being in a place that's so so such a leadership place around technology. Right. So now when building ChainML, you know, we have a big presence here. And then we also have a big presence in Toronto, Canada, where, again, there's a lot of AI talent. Um, I think, you know, there's there's still a bit of an arbitrage opportunity that too many of the great technologists in Toronto are stuck working for uh, slow moving enterprises. And so the opportunity for them to come over to the startups and scale ups is a big one. I think you're going to see a lot more expansion of opportunities for uh, people in, in in Toronto and in other great tech hubs, uh, you know, to complement Silicon Valley. I mean, tech has grown so much that it, it can't be contained within Silicon Valley, but there's still obviously amazing talent pool here. Yeah, no, you're right about it. And, you know, the environment, it's not bad to uh, go from uh, where you are down to Armadillo Willies. But uh, right on the corner in San Antonio. But there's this, you know, you get restaurants, you get that incredible climate, you get Stanford University, 
and probably you probably see as many MIT people out in California as you did in Boston, right? Other than uh, if you walk around Boston, there's probably just as many there. Oh, you went to MIT too. Nice to meet you. <laughs> what did you study? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of MIT alum here. That's that's for sure. I mean, it, it, you know, it used to be there was, uh, you know, a, a tradition of, of watching movies at MIT um, and uh, the, the group that puts it on a uh, lecture series committee. Anytime the movie would stop, people would yell out LSC sucks um, in, in the theater. And one time this happened, you know, when I, shortly after I arrived in Silicon Valley and there was a problem in a movie theater and the same thing happened. Everyone yelled out, LSC sucks. It's like, wait, there's a lot of MIT people here. <laughs> now that's great. And it makes you feel at home. You know, it's kind of nice to have that. So, you know, here's the other part. You know, when we look at teams around the world, and, you know, in GSD, we have 139 companies now from 57 countries. A lot of them are like yourself, Ron. They have deep technical backgrounds. They've gone to IIT uh, in India or Cambridge. But one of the things, how important in your opinion, is marketing and sales to a startup? I mean, it's, it's really important. I, I'd say that, you know, so often, like, you know, when I judge MIT's entrepreneurship competition and mentor, like, you know, I, I had a chance in my last role, I had, you know, when I was at Vector Institute, nonprofit and AI, I had a chance to do more mentoring with Creative Destruction Lab, you know, and, and so often you see brilliant technologists, but, if you build great technology and people don't use it, it doesn't matter. Right. So, you know, marketing and sales is important. You know, I definitely think lean startup and, you know, inspir inspiring ideas from Steve Blank are so important around early on. It's more about discovery and understanding what the customers need. Right. Like a lot of people hear sales and they think the idea is to try to take what I built and jam it down to people's throats and get them to buy it. But, you know, first you need to figure out what they really need. But if you're not figuring out how your technology is actually going to solve a problem for somebody, how it's going to make life better, um, th it, it's not enough, right? And you know you have to figure out how to put it in the language and a value proposition that makes sense for the customer, right? So often technologists like if people just knew what I knew, of course they'd use what I'm building. <laughs> I okay. can't tell you, Ron. You know, and you know we say that an ideal. You know, I've been in the valley. Um, over the 35 years. And one of the things that we say is that, you know, you need to paint pictures with words. You need to be able to enchant people. And I remember I had a course at Stanford and the course they had a professor from the business school and they had somebody from the theater department and it was about presentation skills. And I never had had anything quite like that in my entire life. And it was only a continuing ed course, but for me, it was in the most, the, some of the brightest people on the planet. But what happened is when we got in there, I understood that being able to storytell in the right kind of way that touches people's souls, that's the way you can become a great leader. That's the way you can create a billion dollar company. If you can captivate their attention, captivate their psyche and their spirit, it becomes incredibly interesting. And sometimes you're right. I've heard the product's going to sell itself. We don't have to have any marketing and sales. I said, well, wait a second. <laughs> have you ever heard of customer discovery and validation by Blankendorf? And, you know, but if you can't get it, it's like having a Ferrari in the garage. You got to get the Ferrari out of the garage. You got to take it out. It's one thing about running in the neighborhood. But the most important thing is, can you win Formula One? Can yeah. you win the race? And so I love that you're saying it because I hear it all the time. I just had a conversation with some folks from MIT, graduate students at MIT, and I had this exact conversation with them. I said, listen, you're a Ferrari in the garage, but you better get it out because guess what? You're not the only Ferrari out there. And if you wait too long, there may be too many Ferraris. Get it out. Yeah. The other thing I see so much, you know, is, is teams that are out um, and, and, they, they don't even think about, you know, what's their business model, right? And of course, there's a lot of learning and you can't be sure early on, but, you know, so often I, I'll see people pitching a startup and it's like, they do talk about how they think their product's going to create value, but not at all how they're going to monetize. And, you know, uh, any way of monetizing adds friction, but, you know, not it's necessary right so you know i think yeah, that if you want to survive <laughs> it's like sometimes they forget oh this will be okay but is it going to be profitable 
Is it interesting? How are you going to raise money? How are you going to get those investors interested if you can show them a path, some type of an exit possibility, the path to profit, especially today, right? People want to see how you're going to run a business, really run it. They're not just basing on dreams. So tell me, as you're going down through this, you worked for Terra Data. How was it after going from your own startup to working for Terra Data? Well, you know, I think um, you've probably all heard that people learn sort of they that there's a, a, a size of organization, a type of business they like to be in. And, you know, I definitely prefer being in a smaller, you know, more nimble organization than a larger organization, right? So, uh, you know, I, I, I definitely felt that, you know, at, at the beginning, you know, we had a fair bit of autonomy and that was good, but as time wears on, you tend to get more integrated in and then it's uh, it, more about, you know, as it became more of a, a big company job, you know, it's really not my passion. And, you know, it was interesting going to Google after that, I was in the CTO office focusing on applied AI, um, and, you know, it was, it was interesting because, you know, Google has amazing talent, brilliant people, but, you know, still the same basic issue. It's such a big organization and, and it, it ends up moving so slowly. And, you know, in a way it's worse because so many brilliant people come into Google and, you know, they, they all have ambitions to go and, and drive a, a, a large ambitious agenda. And there's just not enough capacity in the system. Right. So there's a lot of gridlock as so many people are trying to drive an agenda and then there's not enough resources to do all of it. Right. So, wow. you know, that's I, interesting. How long yeah. did you stay at Google? I, I stayed there three years. Um, you know, it's uh, definitely a uh, fascinating learning experience, you know, being focused on AI and sort of how how to have responsible AI that lands well in society. It was really interesting from all of those perspectives and seeing Customer adoption working with Google was really interesting, um, but ultimately was uh, excited to get on to working in you know a smaller you know more nimble environment. Now, how is it when you go in and tell them you're going to leave the company and go to a startup? Is it like, oh, okay, well, it's about your time? Do they do they how do they act in the you know? Because I remember when Google was at the trailer at Stanford University. I think in '96 actually. And yeah. but how was it? What, did they come up and say, "Why? What are you going to do this? And how can we, get, you know, how can we keep you?" Or what do they say? Are they are they supportive of the fact that people move on to startups or not? Yeah, I mean, I think people were supportive. I think they know that when you're experienced in your career, that it, when someone's made up their mind to go and do something else, that uh, you know, you, it, it's usually not a good idea on either side to sort of say, "Hey, like." try to stay, try to counter, et cetera. I mean, you know, it's like a uh, similar way. It's very rare when people say they want to leave a company that I'm leading uh, the leader of that uh, we'll, we'll try to counter because usually it's like, you know, they've decided and, you know, hopefully you've already had the conversations before, before the decision. So you already talked about, you know, what you each want. And, and, and so it's, it shouldn't be a surprise. Right. In that sense. So, yeah, I mean, they wished me well, obviously understood you know, the direction and where I'm going. And, you know, certainly I'm I'm glad to be you know, working in, uh, in again in a startup. And obviously, uh, we when we started uh, ChainML last year, uh, AI was not as hot a topic as it is now. Uh, but right now it's uh, as as much excitement around AI. But, you know with lots of justification given all that's been accomplished, right? It's really unlocking some amazing capabilities that weren't possible until very recently. So if you've gone, you've seen a lot of changes from, I don't remember, was it Ops 5 and Lisp in 96? I don't remember. I remember it from years before that, but I don't remember in 96 what it was like, but the technology surely changed. How do we, you know, we've had, uh, We've been shaken to the core, at least the general public has, with the ChatGPT and generative AI. They don't understand the superpowers that it has to be able to help impact their lives. But how do you, you know, if you look at the future, Ron, you know, some of the things you're doing at ChainML, I know you have a, you know, it's an early stage startup, but how important is machine learning, deep learning, you know, and all the, uh, all the, um, history that you've had how does it really play with chain ml and 
And how does it unlock? How are you going to unlock it for Web3? Because I know you're talking about doing that. How do you unlock it? And and then where does blockchain play? Yeah, um, all good points. You know, so I'd say one, uh, we think deep learning, you know, is going to continue to be a dominant underlying technology for AI. It's been evolutions and advances in deep learning that have gotten it to this point where you have powerful chat bots and image generators and, you know, the, uh, the acceleration and capabilities is dizzying, right? We're going to see much more capable models coming out this year and again next year and ongoing with so much more that they can do. Um, so I think that that's really starting to translate. You know, as a, as a company, we really shifted focus to be much more around the generative AI layer as this emerged. And we realized there's such a need for how do you take these powerful uh, underlying models and make it possible to integrate them into applications to do useful functionality, right? How do you, how do you go beyond? It's super easy to build a demo, right? Everyone's like, oh, here's a demo of chat with my PDF document, right? And it's fine. Um, we're saying like, how do you, no kidding, build powerful product features using generative AI and integrate that, right? So we open sourced a framework to make it possible to, to build agents that are controllable, that you can predict better, that can add that kind of powerful functionality to your application. Now, you know, the idea of decentralized and compute, we still think that's long-term important. You know, tech, blockchain can be useful for micropayments and for lower friction composition of capabilities. So we think that longer term, that's a, that's a direction that's interesting. And, you know, we certainly are working with Web3 customers, like one of our first, our first public customer uh, space and time is a decentralized database company and they're using our council technology to power their Houston chatbot that you know lets users run database queries and forecasts and visualizations and support questions and simplifies API integration right really high value uses of generative AI so we, we're working with web3 customers as well as web2 customers and we think over time, there will be a lot of interest in like, how can you have the right compute running in the right place? Um, we don't think that, you know, running in sort of high margin uh, oligopoly clouds is, is where people want to run all this compute for AI that, you know, having it available with more choices, ultimately having more personal control over the AI, AI will be important. But also I think it's important to sort of have a roadmap. And right now what we see is the big need in Web3 and more generally is how do you actually <clears throat> improve user experience and enhance products using AI capabilities? Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, it does. And then what's the benefit for humanity, right? So we experience, we have the experience, but how's it going to benefit us? I mean, the, the challenge around us is data, right? We got 123 zettabytes of data on the planet. If you took DVDs or CDs and stacked them one on top of another, it would go 94 times between the Earth and the moon today, growing at about 68, 70, 68 to 70 percent per year. So this uh, infobesity challenge that we have around us is, you know, one that even in our personal lives, think about it. how many times the last two weeks has somebody said, hey, Ron, I sent you a mail message. Did you get it? Uh, where'd you send it? Well, I sent it to your Gmail or Yahoo or your corporate um, when did you send it? Two days ago. Let me check. I can't find it. Will you, will you send it again? It must be in spam. So this this challenge, you know, even our personal clouds, we have about 300,000 items. The entire web in 1996 was 257,000 websites. So you have more information in personal cloud the entire web. The problem is your world's following the same trajectory, which means it's doubling every year. In five years with IoT, you're going to have 10 million items. How in the world are we going to make sense of this world? So these... You know, these generative AI, anyhow, we've, we, we talk about a lot, but having the ability to manage this data to help us like an intelligent assistant, like your grandmother, right, with compassion and empathy that can help us to do things, we need these Sherpas to help us. And, um, you know, and, and we better make sure we're training them the right way because just something that's totally pragmatic may not be something <laughs> we, we want to have as a personal Sherpa, right? I think the, the deals with them... Em empathy and compassion. How important do you think, by the way, with all your background, how important is to bring compassion and empathy into these models? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to, to have the right 
personality and tone, the right way of working. Certainly, it's important that we we bring in our values and ways of working. I mean, I think what we're going to see is a world where you have lots of specialized AI uh, capabilities that that serve certain tasks very well, right? So, like at work, you know, we think there's going to be a lot of AI that is optimized for you know a specific function, right? Like, you know, maybe it's, hey, here's a podcast, let me prepare and let me um, put together sort of some key points and then maybe review and and find some highlights and how to promote them, right? Or maybe it's like in a, a, a interviewing, recruiting process, you know, all the way, you know, generating the right position, you know, giving feedback on candidates, highlighting ones, coming up with a personalized thing, set of things to discuss on both sides to make sure that it's a, a high bandwidth discussion following up, right? So I think you're going to see AI integrated into so many of these processes, just like you're saying, like, hey, oh, AI in the personal life, right? Like scheduling the home, right? Like figuring out what are activities we're going to do together. Wouldn't it be awesome to have an AI that can really help you know, make the most of a family vacation, right? So I think go with us on the vacation and talk to us while we're alone. You know, I was talking, I did some research on this, uh, some of these uh, uh, virtual assistants for the European Space Agency. I was just reading about it a bit and it said, you know, you're going to Mars, you get a little lonely. Wouldn't it be nice to take your, your AI with you? So some of the research is, you know, having something there that you can talk to. You can share ideas that can help you with the questions medical questions and mental questions to keep you sharp. It's interesting. We're coming to the top of the show. So final thoughts and how do people get a hold of you, Ron? Yeah, well, um, definitely, you know, feel free to uh, email me at, at ron at chainml.net or, you know, connect with me on X, aka Twitter, uh, where I'm just at Ron Bodkin. You know, certainly what we think is, is such an exciting time to be building using agents, um, building on top of these powerful generative AI models that, you know, we love to hear from people that are looking at how to, how to build more powerful capabilities into their products. A big focus for us has been around improving the analytics in products, you know, making it possible for users to get deep insights from the product um, without having to be a data scientist to have a kind of automated data science support. That's been a big focus for us. And, you know, we're growing the team. So we're certainly interested in hearing from people who share our excitement about the future of generative AI and how building these powerful agents can enable them. So we'd love to hear from people about any of those topics. And um, Gary, certainly a pleasure talking with you here today. Yeah, no, thank you for your time, for taking time to your busy schedule, Ron. It's really appreciated. And thank you to all my audience for joining one more time. GSD presents Silicon Valley AI and Tech. And my name is Gary Fowler, and I'm your host. Stay happy, stay safe, and stay healthy. And I'll be back to you again on Thursday with another exciting edition. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Ron. It's appreciated.